But before doing so, I would like to express my deepest thanks to Giorgio Bernardi for this invitation to this fantastic colloquium. And I have to make an announcement. Can you hear me? Because there is some, yes, okay. I want to make an announcement because uh, Dr. Gajobori could not attend the meeting, but he will be replaced by uh, Dr. Jürgen Brosius, whom you heard already in the previous uh, sessions. And uh, as you know, this session is devoted to a very important topics, not to say that the other topics were not important. <laughs> <coughs> called the evolution and developmental biology because a, an obvious question that comes to the mind of everyone who has to deal with evolution is well genome evolution is very nice and uh, protein folding uh, evolution of protein structure also but uh, what happened during evolution to build up the highly sophisticated organization of the body plan and also the corresponding uh, complexity of the physiological functions, uh, not to speak about the brain function, but uh, even a function like uh, vision coming from unicellular to multicellular organism is raising very important uh, <coughs> points. So the first speaker of this uh, very important session, again, will be Eric Davidson. Uh, needless to say that he's a very known pioneer in the field. He will speak about uh, evolution of the animal body plan as change in developmental gene regulatory network structure. Eric. Thank you, <laughs> Francois. So I too would like to thank Giorgio for this arranging this extremely interesting symposium and including me. <clears throat> so I really uh, am not going to talk much about evolution per se, <clears throat> but I'm going to talk about what I think we have to do to understand evolution and what this field will be like in the future. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about sea urchin embryos. And I'd like to start with this image, which shows uh, it's a small field of about a thousand almost completely identical late embryos. And you look at this and you immediately know something. You know that there's an encoded program for development, because the only way that something like this can be mass produced and every single one develop exactly the same way and express the same genes in the same places. And that's the basis of the problem of development. <clears throat> so I want to start with a uh, simple concept, which for me is a concept that is a key that unlocks a lot of complexity of development, the regulatory state concept, is, which is perfectly obvious. If you consider a regulatory state as the sum of all of the active regulatory proteins or transcription factors expressed in any given time and place, that everything else that happens occurs downstream of regulatory state. And so you immediately realize that the key to understanding the program for development is the program that sets up regulatory states, which change dynamically in both space and time. <clears throat> so we now know enough to realize that regulatory states, which in any given cell type will involve several dozen transcription factors that are specifically expressed there, at least. Uh, regulatory states are set up by networks of interacting genes that uh, use each other's products, transcription factors, to determine their state of activity. And they also control expression and interpretation of signals. <clears throat> so here's a syllogism on this slide about evolution. <clears throat> the developmental process is specified by these gene regulatory networks. And if we're considering what is the cause of changes in body plan, obviously it has to be changes in the program of development that makes the body plan in each generation. And therefore, 
we really cannot hope to explain evolutionary change in body plan without interpreting it mechanistically as changes in the structure of the gene regulatory networks that set up regulatory states. Well, there's a little practical problem that lies in our way, which is, can we solve gene regulatory networks? And if we solve them, can we solve them completely enough so that we actually have a causal explanation for this process? If we could do that, then we would be able to consider what happens when we alter the structure of these networks, either uh, synthetically in a laboratory or what has happened naturally in evolution. And evolution can become a, a laboratory study of alteration in gene regulatory networks. So what I'm really gonna talk about for the next while is a uh, challenge that we gave to ourselves to try to ask whether the, a fairly well-developed gene regulatory network that we've been working on for about a decade now for early search and development actually sufficiently provides an explanation for the process of development. <clears throat> and abstractly speaking, for the uh, continuous dynamic change in specific regulatory states in space that powers that process. And so, <clears throat> What we did was to build a predictive model based on the gene regulatory network and try to build a model that would compute the changes in regulatory state for every gene, and then we could compare that directly to observation. In system biology, one of the major problems is the problem of sufficiency. Whenever you're dealing with a large causally related system, it's a, always a non-trivial problem to determine whether you know enough to actually explain what that system's doing. And this was a direct attempt to get at that. So a few words about the Searchin embryo. It's a very simple embryo. Uh, the picture you saw before was the end of embryogenesis. That organism is able to feed and live free, free living, have a free living existence uh, in the ocean for several months before it turns into a sea urchin. <coughs> It begins as a single, as an embryo that consists of single layers of cells. Unlike Drosophila or frog embryos, there are no multiple cell layers. And it has maybe 15 or 20 cell types. The ones that I'm gonna be concerned with are color-coded in this diagram. The uh, purple uh, cells become the skeleton. The yellow cells become the anterior part of the gut. The blue cells become mesodermal, mesenchymal mesodermal cells and pigment cells, which by the way are essentially the immune cells of the embryo. And the orange cells become the hindgut or the posterior gut. So this embryo is radially organized early in development. You see it here from the side, but if you looked at it from the bottom, as you'll see later in this talk, it's a series of concentric rings of specification. So unrolling that from the center out, so looking along the radius from the left to the right of this screen where this is the center and this is the, uh, the periphery of that series of concentric rings, there are four different regulatory states that we would like to explain the uh, appearance of. The skeletogenic one, the mesodermal one, and the anterior endodermal one, and the posterior endodermal one. This is a network that we think is relatively complete, <clears throat> or we have thought. It includes every uh, regulatory gene that we could find that's expressed specifically in any of those domains in the embryo up to about the time that gastrulation begins. So in other words, up to just about this period. The gas gastrula gastrulation begins right after 30 hours with the invagination of the gut. So the form of this, for those who are not used to looking at this presentation, is that each gene is represented, is named, and is represented by a horizontal line, which is its uh, cis-regulatory apparatus. And the inputs into it are given by the colored lines that impinge on it, and its output is color-coded. So you can see that this gene, for example, regulates this gene, and it also regulates this <coughs> gene, also regulates that gene and is regulated by those genes. So those inputs are the outputs of other genes in the network. 
if that's the information, the crucial information that we would like to test. <clears throat> the network now includes uh, more than just the colored parts. The diagram, there are about 80 regulatory genes in it. Uh, it's based on observation and experiment. The observations are spatial uh, uh, indications of where these genes are expressed done by in C2 hybridization with a three hour time resolution basically and temporal measurements of expression and quantitative done about every 20 minutes. Then we did a very large scale perturbation analysis so that every single expression of every one of these genes has been taken out of the system and the effects measured quantitatively and sometimes spatially on all the other genes in the system, which gives you the epistatic relationships. And that together with a uh, relative temporal expression and a great deal of cis regulatory analysis uh, gave us that network that you saw. <clears throat> My question is, how much are we missing or how much don't we know? And is what's in that network sufficient to actually predictively explain what happens? So what I'm going to describe to you is a model that's unpublished as yet that was <clears throat> made this last <clears throat> year uh, by two of my uh, postdoctoral colleagues, Isabel Peter and Emmanuel Fowler and myself. And the claim that I will try to demonstrate for you is that this model uh, captures the regulatory logic that's specified in the architecture of the gene regulatory network that you just saw and that it successfully predicts the spatial regulatory state accurately through time. You'll see the results. And in fact, it tells us that the network does contain sufficient information to constitute an explanation for what happens. <clears throat> it also provides us with a wonderful tool for in silico re-engineering, which I think is what will, uh, has a great deal of uh, interesting implications for the future of evolutionary study. So the first point is that gene regulatory expression in these embryos is really a Boolean function. Genes are either on in a certain place or they're off in a certain place. Here's a single ring of cells expressing this gene. The other, other cells aren't expressing it. The genes are expressing, the cells are, these cells are expressing the red gene, these are expressing the green gene. This ring of cells here, which is a neurogenic ring of cells, are expressing that gene and no other cells expressing it. And the level of sensitivity of these observations is roughly approximate to the level of prevalence of the proteins that would be required to, for occupancy of the target cis-regulatory modules. <clears throat> So we can make a Boolean expression chart. This is one domain and this is another spatial domain. Here are genes and this is time. And you can see that genes are expressed in this domain, they're not expressed here. They're expressed for a while and they turn off. So it's both dynamic and spatially variable and it's this type of, it's this presentation that we would like to be able to compute based on the information in the network. And the lower part of this chart shows you a, a typical result of the perturbation analysis. For example, it shows that if I take BLIMP1 out of the system, that these two genes, Brachyuria BLIMP itself are not affected, but brain 124 expression goes down uh, dramatically because BLIMP1 provides a positive input to that. On the other hand, KRL goes up because BLIMP1 represses KRL. <coughs> so, this is again a uh, essentially a Boolean information chart. <clears throat> this shows some of the epistemological relations that I'm going to be discussing in the next few minutes. So here, it's in C here are the expression profiles in C2 hybridization observations and temporal uh, output of given genes which give uh, charts just like this one here. And the gene regulatory network model comes from these perturbation analyses where if we take a given transcription factor out of the system, expression of this target gene goes down, these are unaffected, this one goes up because it was a repressor, and so forth. And so that's the type of information that gives rise 
to this perturbation matrix. And together with cis regulatory analysis, the perturbation analysis gives us the gene regulatory network model. And we use the information in that model to uh, construct equations for each gene in the system that would tell what that gene responds to. So let's consider how it works in life. In life, every gene has a uh, unchanging piece of DNA or several piece segments of DNA, which consists of its hardwired uh, regulatory set of target sites. And when those target sites are occupied, it will either be expressed or repressed <coughs> by the factors, by the uh, combination of factors <coughs> that occupy those sites. So we tried to capture this by giving each gene a, an equation that said what the inputs were from the network model and what the logic by which the multiple inputs were are utilized from cis regulatory analysis and other information. For example, it might be that, that a gene works only if factor A and factor B are together, otherwise you get no output, so it's an and logic function. And so we used a s simple Boolean logic and uh, and, uh, and not and or to uh, model these uh, systems. And so as in life where the DNA sequence never changes, our vector equations never change while the model, while the model runs either. And so we have pages of uh, equations. We made up one for each gene based on the information in the model. This top one, for example, says if two hours earlier than the time we are right now, uh, ETS is, is uh, expressed, and uh, at that time, the repressor HES-C is not being expressed, then this gene will be active, and so forth. And where there are multiple modules controlling a given gene, we have an equation for each, model, each module. So we had to put dynamics into this system, and several years ago, Hamid Bellori and I carried out a more or less first principles uh, analysis, uh, kinetic analysis, using a number of measured rate constants, equilibrium constants, uh, and so forth for, for a, a number of transcription factors, turnover rates, synthesis rates, all of which were, were known and had been measured both on an average basis and for a number of different molecules in, in the 80s and early 90s. And so uh, we simulated what we call the uh, a gene cascade to give us the amount of time that would elapse between the time that a given regulatory gene is activated, transcribes its product, the product is translated, it accumulates sufficiently, goes back into the nucleus and activates its target gene. And the simulations under the most likely set of conditions look like this. And uh, if anybody wants to see the model, I can ask me about it in the discussion and I'll show it to you. Um, and this shows you that there's a two to three hour time between the time the blue gene goes on, activates the green gene, between the time the green gene's on, gene goes on, activates the red gene. So what we did as a first approximation was just apply this step time uh, to every such transaction that would occur in this model. And the way we ran the model was after setting up the initial conditions, which were maternal uh, transcription factors that we knew were of, of importance, <clears throat> then every hour we assess the state of output of the, all the genes that made transcription factors and used those outputs as inputs for all the genes and then repeated the computation for all the four domains that we're looking at, the skeletogenic, the mesodermal, the anterior endoderm, and posterior endoderm, in silico, and so uh, every the uh, effect the effect of the previous state of transcription one step time unit before was dealt with every hour th for 30 hours. <clears throat> so the model output then is that it computes what genes will be expressed where, and so we can compare that directly to what we observed. So this is the Boolean expression matrix, and this is the calculated matrix which our model produced for us. And I've just been discussing these vector equations. 
which came from the gene regulatory network model. And I also discussed the temporal relations, where we, uh, which we took from this earlier analysis. And there's one other thing the model has to know, which is what cells are next to what cells, because their signaling is intimately involved in all of the developmental functions uh, that occur, and these various domains induce gene expressions in one another. And so we had to instruct the model what cells are next to what cells at each point in time, which means no, it has to know the cell lineage and the geometry. And without uh, going into details, uh, we fed the model this information, which is what was the previous ancestor of each cell at the end of the process, if you go back in time earlier, and also what cells are directly contiguous at each point in time to every given cell. So now we have the vector equations, the contiguity map, and the step time, and we could run the computation and generate uh, an output which should either will or will not represent what we see. So it's a direct test of sufficiency. <coughs> now I'm going to show you what happens. <coughs> so here is a uh, presentation of the, uh, of the results of a direct comparison between the computation and observation. And time goes from top to bottom in each of the four regulatory and fate domains. And in one hour intervals, so this is 30 hours, this is fertilization. And what you're looking at here is a series of gray squares if the gene is inactive and colored squares if it's active. And if you just see a gray square or a colored square, it means that the computation was exactly the same as the result. If you see a little black open box, it means that the model and the computation that the uh, computed uh, expression was less than three hours different from what we observed, but it was different. But that could be meaningless since the time resolution of the in situ hybridization observations is three hours. So this is a either a minor or, or an insignificant deviation. If, it, if the model turned a gene on more than three hours earlier than it was supposed to be on, or or later than a solid black bar is obtained. And you see a few of those here. There's a couple of things we could not explain, and they're striped. And here's one of them, and here's the other one. There are two, two events where a gene is turned off in life, and we had, our model did not predict that, it was, that its expression be extinguished. Now, you'll notice that almost all of these squares uh, display no discrepancy between the computation and the observation. In fact, out of 2,770 blocks of computation, there's only a few percent where there's any significant discrepancy. There are a few genes that we did not model because we didn't know enough and they're shown in white, but all the rest were uh, computed from scratch, de novo, from the information that I told you. So uh, here's a case where the model failed to turn a gene on in time, although it did turn it on eventually. And <clears throat> here's these two cases where uh, we don't know why this gene was turned off, or three cases actually. So that's a remarkable uh, convergence between agreement between what we computed and what we see. In terms of space, this is a summary. And what you're looking at here, so here's the, uh, here are the domains, the central skeletogenic domain, the mesodermal domain next to it, the anterior endoderm domain outside of that, and the posterior endoderm domain outside of that. And here they are, here are the genes, and here a gray square means that both the model and the observation say that this gene should not be expressed in this spatial domain, and a colored square means that both the model computation and the observations say that this gene should be expressed in that particular domain. So you will see that with the exception of this gene and this gene, which are, have black symbols of different kinds which <coughs> I won't go into, they, in each case 
there was an error in the computation. But every other place, the uh, domain-specific patterns of regulatory gene expression were correctly computed. <clears throat> so I'm now going to um, describe for you some perturbations that we did. And we did a number of perturbations. I'm only going to show you two of them to, for, to save time. And what we did was to try to represent in silico experiments that uh, had been done where we knew what the result would be, but either on gene expression or on, the, uh, on something in the embryo. And the first one consisted of a, uh, a perturbation of notch signaling. So it turns out that in this embryo, the skeletogenic cells emit a delta ligand, which is the ligand that activates notch, and the consequence of that is to cause the specification of uh, mesoderm by activating several mesodermal regulatory genes that are high up in the hierarchy, and all the resulting mesodermal genes uh, require notch signaling directly or indirectly for that mesoderm to be specified, although there are only a few, two, two to be exact, uh, specific direct targets. So in silico, we decided to block notch signaling in the skeletogenic domain. And so here's the diagram of the experiment. And normally what happens if you block not signaling is that you get no mesoderm. The blue ring is absent. And instead, the cells that should become mesoderm become endoderm, just like the adjacent ring of cells, which, never, which do not see the not signal. So if you do that in life, uh, what happens is you lose the mesodermal uh, output. And here's an example. One of the direct target genes is, in fact, this gene that I showed you before. These are the cells emitting the, the delta notch ligand. These are the cells that receive it. They turn on this gene. And if, and eventually they turn into these pigment cells. And if notch signaling is blocked in any one of six different ways, you end up with an albino embryo, which also lacks all the mesodermal cells inside of it. So the question is, would the model produce uh, a set of gene regulatory outputs which lack mesodermal genes? So we turn delta off manually by altering the vector equation. Uh, and so this is the normal condition where that gene is expressed only in the skeletogenic cells, as I was just saying. We turn it off, and the expected result is that there would be no change in the skeletogenic uh, there would be no change in the skeletogenic gene output except for that. The mesodermal genes should be turned off. Uh, endodermal genes should be expressed where the mesodermal genes were expressed, and there should be no change in the posterior endoderm. And that's exactly what happened uh, in the model. And just look at the top row of this diagram, because I don't have time to show you these other examples. So <clears throat> here are the uh, skeletogenic genes, which remain the same as they were before. Uh, mesodermal genes are here, and instead of being expressed, they're turned off. But endodermal genes uh, are the ones shown in blue, which are turned on in what is now the mesoderm region. You can see they're the same genes as are normally expressed in the endoderm there. So. In other words, we recreated in silico the uh, regulatory effects of extinguishing uh, notch expression in those cells. And I'll show you one more example. So in 1935, Horstadius did a beautiful experiment in which he removed the micromeres, which are the four cells of the ancestors of the skeletogenic apparatus in search and embryo, uh, at fourth cleavage from the embryo he cut them off with a microneedle and stuck them on top of the embryo, of a recipient embryo. So now it has two sets of micromeres, its own and the transplanted ones. And he showed that a second gut would grow in from the transplant, from the cells adjacent to the transplanted embryo. The first, so we repeated that experiment in the early 90s, and this is the uh, uh, photograph from that. So here's the initial gut, and here's the second gut that grows in from the transplanted cells. So does the model have enough information in it to predict that we can set up the regulatory states that eventually give rise to the gut? 
So we model that in the following way. If this is a normal situation, again, the skeletogenic cells, the mesoderm, the <coughs> anterior endoderm, the posterior endoderm, looked at from the bottom. Now let's look at the embryo from the top after transplanting the micromeres. And there will be a field of cells, and we can ask whether the ring of cells directly surrounding the transplanted micromeres, which immediately sink into the uh, epithelial layer of cells that they find themselves in, where the first ring would express the blue genes, which cause these cells to become mesoderm, and then whether the second ring would express the yellow genes, which cause them to become anterior endoderm, and would the third ring of cells express the orange genes, which cause them to become the posterior endoderm. And the results, again, shown in the same way are here, and what you see here is a comparison of whether ring one expresses blue genes as shown here, and whether, and if you get a straight colored box with no black symbols or, or, or red symbols, then that's what happened. Does ring two give the same gene expression pattern as the normal uh, anterior endoderm, this yellow ring? Yes. And the same with ring three. And the only uh, discrepancies are shown by these open boxes, and the reason uh, that the model did not predict them was because of these white genes that we didn't have uh, explanation for in the model. If we turn them on manually, then everything comes out perfectly. So uh, I claim then that uh, we have a system that has sufficient explanatory information so that under normal or perturbed circumstances, we can compute what this uh, embryo is doing with respect to its regulatory genes. And I think there's some very important conclusions that can be drawn from this. <clears throat> it shows that the gene regulatory network we started with, from which the vector equations came, uh, in fact is sufficiently close to complete that we're not missing any big pieces so that we can make this whole system run uh, pretty accurately, progressively, in time, with a very complicated pattern of expression of about 40 different genes. <clears throat> of course, there are some things that we don't know, but you can see them, they pop right out at you, so you can find out exactly what you don't know, which is very useful. And it inverts the usual situation in developmental biology, which I always like to say is it's a sea of phenomenology with a few islands of causality floating around in it. And I think this has inverted it. Now we have a, frame, a causal framework with a few islands of things that we don't understand. <clears throat> at this level of gene expression. So it also tells us that we don't really need uh, other levels of explanation uh, for this stage of development because uh, what's included here in the input information is just what the inputs in terms of transcription factors that read DNA sequences are and what the target sites are for those particular genes. And I think that the uh, layers of regulation, which we all know exist and uh, play a prominent role, in, particularly in stabilizing uh, regulatory states later in development, are uh, less important during the time that the embryo has the job of continuously changing dynamically its spatial regulatory states. And the embryo control really depends directly on a hardwired genomic regulatory system which produces these regulatory states. And finally, we have a tool now, <clears throat> as I showed you, where we can do perturbations in silico. And this is a tool that can be used for re-engineering, rewiring these networks and predicting what the result will be. And it's also a tool that can be used for studying evolution. Because <clears throat> as I started out by saying, and considering divergence of developmental pathways, that has to mean rewiring of the gene regulatory networks. And we can now ask specifically, once we know enough about a network, what things can be changed here without wrecking the whole system uh, that are flexible or that will give certain expected results in terms of uh, change uh, regulatory states or expression patterns. So I think the future will be that we will be studying evolution by doing that kind of experiment, and 
and re recreating uh, evolutionary events by altering uh, gene regulatory networks. And so the study will become an experimental study rather than a discursive and correlative study. <coughs> so I'd like to stop there and just mention that the uh, work that I discussed was mainly done by Isabel Peter and Emmanuel Farr. Um, <coughs> and so the networks that I described were the result of the work of all these people and many others over the previous 10 years. <coughs> so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Eric, sorry. We, we are a little out of time, so oh, okay. we, if there is a very precise and pressing questions, maybe just one, and then we will go back to the discussion later on, okay? Yes. regulatory sequences according to your scheme yes. are always accessible in this embryo at this time all it, it takes to make this to, to get the results that we see is to have the yes. necessary upstream genes being transcribed so the answer has to be yes yes and chromatin structure is not relevant at this stage in other words it is I think it's downstream of the yes. uh, of the yes. transcription factor DNA interactions. So, is it possible, though, that well, let's call them epigenetic effects would alter, let's say, the time constants? So the plan would remain the same, but the time to diffuse or the level, so that you'd get a different, the same overall plan, but a different well, you saw developmental shape. You saw, though, that uh, this thing works like a clock and assuming the same step time for every inter every transaction throughout this whole thing, we got pr a pretty accurate prediction of what happens. So, But not the actual morphology, just... No, no, no. I'm not telling you about anything except turning on the okay, regular yeah, I understand genes, that. which cause everything else to happen. So, but I'm just suggesting that maybe epigenetic phenomena could, could modify the details within the same set? I think downstream of it, the game okay. is open. Yeah. But not, not at this level. Okay. okay, thank you. We have to move on. <clears throat> thank you. No, 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 no. <laughs> Later on. Well, the next speaker is, of course, as you know from the program, also a very well-known pioneer in the field, namely Walter, Walter Gering, and he will talk about the evolution of uh, the evolution of uh, vision. Walter, <coughs> thank you. For the last uh, 15 to 20 years, I have been working on eye evolution and uh, uh, we started out by working on animal eyes and now I have been tracing back the process of vision all the way uh, back to cyanobacteria and I would like to give you a guided tour from cyanobacteria all the way to humans. Cyanobacteria are a, a very interesting group of prokaryotes. They have invented multicellularity. They start out as single cells, uh, and then they invented also cell differentiation. Can I have a pointer? Where is the pointer gone? Is there a pointer somewhere? Thank you. In Anabena, for example, you already have two different cell types. You have the heterocyst and you have the, the normal cell. The normal cell is a photosynthetic cell capable of photosynthesis. 
and the heterocyst is capable of nitrogen fixation. Two very elementary processes and uh, this has to happen in an anaerobic condition and this in an aerobic condition. So they separate the two, the two functions into two different cell types. It is advantageous if you are a photosynthesizer to see the light and <coughs> that's happening already in cyanobacteria. And we, uh, I just found out this spring that in fact cyanobacteria have evolved the first eye spots. And you see this uh, green spot here, this is a single cell uh, cyanobacterium and it has these pigment granules here which are characteristic for the eye spots also in higher organisms. Uh, they are reflectors of the light and uh, the, if you destroy this eye spot here, these, uh, these cells are no longer phototactic. So they, they use their uh, visual apparatus for three things, for phototaxis and also uh, two things at least, uh, and also to calibrate their internal clock. Cyanobacteria have a very precise internal clock and they calibrate it with the sunlight and uh, for that they need these eye spots. If you eliminate, eliminate the eye spot, it's no longer functional. So this is very interesting because cyanobacteria are the oldest fossil, fossils that are known. This is from Western Australia. Uh, <coughs> and uh, these, I went specially to see these uh, <coughs> Uh, fossils in the museum of, of uh, West, in West, in, uh, no, this, the museum is not in Western Australia, it's in Sydney, and uh, you see these stromatolites, and they are 3,500 million years old. So this is remarkable. And uh, so <coughs> we, we go here, if you go then, out on the beach in uh, Sharks Bay, you can actually see these uh, layers and layers of cyanobacteria which form these stromatolites. And, uh, you, and the living cells are on top and the interior cells are dead and then become gradually foss fossils. Now if we go to the algae or uh, protozoa, uh, here is Chlamydomonas, and you, we see very similar eye spots, and we know a lot about this eye spot through the work of Hegemon and Nagel and so on. And uh, where is the eye spot? Uh, there are two flagella here. This is the chloroplast, and the eye spot is actually in the chloroplast. Now, what is the chloroplast? The chloroplast is a domesticated cyanobacterium. It's a symbiont originally, and then it becomes domesticated. The genes are transferred from the symbiont to the nucleus of the host cell, and uh, therefore <coughs> the, this certainly goes back to the cyanobacteria, and there is also molecular evidence for that, which I will show you in a minute. Now, the <coughs> these, uh, these algae already have rhodopsin. They have a form of rhodopsin, which is uh, localized in the cell membrane and uh, here is the, uh, here are these pigment granules, carotene pigment granules which reflect the light onto the rhodopsin here. And then <coughs> there are uh, uh, several uh, channel rhodopsins, uh, channel rhodopsin 1 and 2. And in this most primitive case, the rhodopsin is simply an ion channel and, uh, and transports uh, mostly calcium, but also sodium and, uh, and hydrogen into, into the cell, and that is uh, then causing the light response. And the flagella are <coughs> uh, connected to the uh, input from the eye spot. 
Now, if we go to multicellular algae, this is what looks, the situation is very much the same. Again, the eye spot is in the chloroplast. You see the pigment granules here, and in the plasma membrane above here is the rhodopsin is localized. And that brings me to my Russian doll hypothesis. So initially, uh, the eye spots were localized in the cyanobacterium, and uh, the cyanobacterium was taken up first by a red alga into a eukaryotic cell, and now we have three membranes, an outer bacterial membrane, or two membranes, an outer and the inner bacterial membrane, and in between there is a peptidoglycan layer. Now this whole thing was then taken up into the yellow cell. The yellow cells are several, several of them, and now you have basically four membranes. You have the two bacterial ones, and then the one from the red alga, and the one from the yellow cell. Now in the case of dinoflagellates and euglenids, the uh, primary host membrane is lost, the red algal membrane is lost, but uh, there are still three membranes indicating that this is a secondary uptake of the cyanobacterial uh, chloroplast. Now why dinoflagellates? Dinoflagellates are highly interesting creatures uh, because they have evo evolved the most sophisticated single-celled eyes. You see here one novia, and here is erythropsis. They have an eye which is derived from the chloroplast, which has a lens, it has a cornea, it has a pigment cup, it has a retina in the back, it has a vitreous body. It's just like a human eye, but made by a single cell. I don't ask me how, how uh, I explain this. This is my next scientific life, and, uh, but it's, it's very fascinating. Uh, <coughs> we cannot breed, unfortunately, these things yet, or not yet very well, because they are no longer autotrophic. They can no longer photosynthesize. They have given up on photosynthesis and have... Uh, converted their chloroplast into an eye-like structure. But we have made from a single cell, we have made a, a cDNA library, and from this cDNA library, my collaborator Hiroshi Suga has uh, cloned several cDNAs, among others, a uh, rhodopsin-like molecule. Uh, we have only about 500 base pairs, but that's enough to do in situ hybridization. And uh, this was done in uh, Koshabori's lab. He can uh, unfortunately not be here, but his postdoc then has in situ hybridized this, uh, our cDNA to these beasts. And what he finds is that it really hybridizes to what we consider to be the retina. And I would like to remind you that our retina actually has very similar stacked membranes in the rods and the cones. So uh, <coughs> a very similar kind of setup. Here we have used birefringence, polarized light to demonstrate that these molecules are highly ordered in these stacked membranes. And so <coughs> uh, I would like to push the uh, Russian doll hypothesis one step further. So you have to the cyanobacterium here, you have the uh, uh, the red alga here, and then you have the dinoflagellate here. Now, what's the first history of that? And I would like to propose that the dinoflagellates, which are very common symbionts in, in corals, as well as in jellyfish, that they carried some of the eye-forming genes from uh, all the way from cyanobacteria to higher animals. There are several indications that this might be the case. Uh, first of all, <coughs> it's very common that uh, 
cyanobacteria. Here is one which has perfectly good chloroplasts with uh, xylocoid membranes. They uh, live in, in the polyp of Cassiopeia, for example, and they can slip in and out like nothing. Uh, they can be cultured in isolation or they be, can be cultured with the polyp. It doesn't matter. So this is a very uh, strong symbiontic relationship. And uh, so the eye-bearing uh, dinoflagellates could as well have been taken up by some of the, by some of the uh, uh, jellyfish. Now, <coughs> there is one other observation which suggests that dinoflagellates are related or have transferred their gene, some of their genes to the uh, jellyfish. And these are the, the nettle cells, the uh, nidoblasts. And here you see the nidoblasts, these nettle cells, which stinging cells of the jellyfish. They occur only in two groups, in the dinoflagellates and in the cnidarians. And so it could well be that uh, these were in, transferred via endosymbiontic gene transfer from the dinoflagellate to the cnidarians. Here are the cnidarian ones. They are very similar uh, in structure. This was already postulated by Edouard Chateau in 1937 or something. And now, uh, just last year, it was found out that to trigger, here you see the, the uh, nettle, and then they explode. They are under high pressure. Then you uh, open the cover, and this thing shoots out and penetrates your skin. And uh, it was shown that this can be caused by rhodopsin. It's a rhodopsin receptor here in the cover. You shine light on them, and you can shoot them out. So, very interesting. Now, <coughs> in higher organisms, in animals, uh, the, the most primitive uh, phylum which has sophisticated eyes are the cnidarians, the jellyfish. And uh, we have worked mostly on this one, which is Cladonema. And uh, <coughs> it has perfectly good eyes with a lens, with pigment cells in yellow, and with photoreceptor cells of the ciliary type in red. And uh, the interesting thing is here, uh, when we get a light signal, we uh, transform the sig transfer the signal to the brain and from the brain to the muscle. But these poor animals don't have a brain. So what do they do? They attach the eye right to the muscle. Here is the arm which is to be, to be controlled. And, uh, and now they, they can signal directly from the eye to the muscle. The next stage of sophistication you find in Tripedaria, for example, box jellyfish. They have batteries of sensory organs. They have two eyes with lenses and retina and so on. They have a statolite here. And the, uh, this whole battery occurs, four, to four, four of these batteries occur around the animal. Again, they have no brain, but here you begin to see the, the evolution of a brain because the animal has to integrate the information which comes from the eyes and from the statolite. If it uh, is near the surface, it can use the eyes to find out what's up and what's down. If, however, it's in, in a deep depth, it can see, not see the light, but then it can use the statolite. So there are now nervous connections are evolving, which begin to resemble a little brain. And uh, this leads me to the hypothesis that the eye was there before the brain. The eye is a sensory organ. Uh, the, the brain is an information processing organ, like a computer. If you have no information, you need no computer. So the uh, information procuring organ has to evolve first, and this is in contrast to the dogmatic view which is around in the, in the literature. 
So again, I'm going against the dogma, but I think with, with fairly good arguments. <laughs> now, we were studying in the Clodonema, we, we were cloning the opsin genes, and it was uh, quite surprising. I, I expected two or three opsins. If they can have color vision or something, it might be, uh, you might find two or three or four opsins, but far from the truth, what we find is 18 opsin genes, and of these, only six are expressed in the eye. So opsin can have various functions, probably sensory functions too in the tentacles, or all over the skin, or some in the manubrium. In the manubrium, they are associated with the gonads, and uh, the, the snorkelers among you must know that corals spawn in response to the moonlight, and uh, so this is a good place to put, you put your sensory organs in right near the organs which have to spawn. So this, this was a big surprise, we are currently trying to find out how these uh, hopsins function together with Sojo Yokohama, who is in the audience. And now, if you uh, study the evolution of these rhodopsins, uh, <coughs> it becomes very interesting, but it also shows the limitations which we have. So you have bacterial rhodopsins here in, in violet, and uh, some of these are sensory rhodopsins, and uh, <coughs> these are shown in violet. Now, where are the cyanobacteria? The cyanobacteria are here, and also can here in Fluorobacter. And uh, the cyanobacteria obviously have undergone a horizontal gene transfer because uh, this, this is, has nothing to do with the pedigree here. They are on, one, on, on, on two ends of the pedigree. And uh, you have here the channel opsins of Volvox and of Chlamydomonas, the single channel opsins. Now, where are, the, where are the dinoflagellates? They are nicely here, and they're very close to Gluobacter, you see. It, it clearly indicates that they got their uh, rhodopsin gene from cyanobacteria, and uh, this, this is very clear. Then you have the fungi over here. They also have opsins, but all of these opsins are quite different from our animal opsins because our opsin is a G-coupled protein receptor, and uh, this is the, the model for uh, beef opsin, which is very similar to the human opsin. And uh, what you see here is uh, is a highly conserved 7 alpha helix, this transmembrane protein. It sits in the membrane here. And here is the famous lysine residue. And to this lysine residue is the <coughs> retinol attached. The retinol undergoes cis trans isomerization. The protein undergoes a conformational change and signals. But the signal is not direct as it is in fungi and in Chlamydomonas and so on because this uh, signal is then amplified by a G protein and there are actually several G proteins uh, which come into action and then amplify the signal and it's a second channel which opens or closes in response to the light. So there are two major types of photo ciliary and raptomeric photoreceptors. Uh, I've taken this diagram from Kirchner and Gerhard, and they labeled it completely wrongly. They said here uh, vertebrate and here invertebrate. But this is a typical molecular biologist's notion because well, they, they extrapolated from the mouse to all vertebrates and from the rosophila to all invertebrates. But if you really are a zoologist like myself, you know that uh, this is not confined to vertebrates, but uh, cl uh, Clodonema I showed you has the ciliary photoreceptors as well, and, uh, and in, in worms, in annelids, you find both types, and also in scallops, you find both types 
so forth to be saved side by side. But it's a, it's a serious evolutionary problem. How do you get from a single channel opsin to, to a, a G-coupled protein opsin? This one signals to, through cyclic GMP and then <coughs> closes the channel, so you get hyperpolarization. And the other one uh, is opening a channel. That's the, the one in Drosophila, for example. But you cannot extrapolate from Drosophila to all invertebrates. And that goes with a uh, uh, phosphorinositol pathway and calcium. So uh, here we have a, a break in the, in the reasoning line, and I have to find this out, how you get from, from the uh, microbial opsins to the, to the uh, animal opsins. But there is a, this, the second speaker after me will have something to say about this. They have a very nice work on this issue. And now we, uh, we made a pedigree of, our, of all the known uh, Cnidarian opsins. And what you <coughs> see here is that the most of them map is this, uh, so you have the ciliary opsins, the, uh, the raptomeric opsins, and here you have the, the G0 opsins, three classes already, three different coupling to G proteins. And they're already there in in the uh, salentrates. So uh, the, there must have been a rapid radiation of the opsin molecules when we go from uh, to higher to animals. And now <coughs> quickly to our older work which showed that uh, animal opsins, uh, animal eyes can be explained by a monophyletic evolution rather than a polyphyletic evolution. Here you have the camera type eye of an owl. Here you have uh, an octopus eye. And here you have a, a drosophila eye. Now these eyes are camera type, a single lens, a retina, and an iris. And here you have very many individual eyes, individual lenses, uh, and batteries, a photoreceptor. This looks very different from this and develops very different from this. So during my doctoral exam, I had to uh, say that these have evolved completely independently. Now, 40 years later, I proved myself completely wrong. The neo-Darwinists claimed that the eye has evolved 40 to 60 times independently, and uh, now I have to prove the, the contrary. This is what we call Darwinian prototype. This is a very simple eye which has only two cells, a photoreceptor and a pigment cell. And the scallops have uh, mirror eyes. They have a mirror in the back and a lens in the front. And if you didn't know that scallops have uh, beautiful eyes, next time when you order Coquille Saint-Jacques, please look at their eyes. They are quite wonderful. And the eyes are very old structure. Trilobites have already compound eyes in the Cambrium, so. Okay, for Charles Darwin, this was a big problem, the eye, because not even his wife believed him when he came to eyes. Uh, he, he wrote an early draft of the origin of species, and she believed most of what he said in this draft, as a good wife should, at least in the 19th century. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but uh, when he came to eyes, he said, this is absurd. How can you claim that an eagle's eye, with all of its sophistication, uh, comes about simply by uh, variation, random variation and selection? And then uh, he was in deep trouble, so he, uh, he wrote an entire chapter on difficulties with the theory, and the origin of species is one of the most honest books that I know of. And he came out with this idea that there must have been a simple prototype which consisted simply of a photoreceptor cell which he called a nerve and then a pigment cell which shields it from one side. Now this allows the animal to see the direction of light and that confirms a tremendous, confers a tremendous 
selective advantage and therefore this was very successful. Now selection can work on this and improve it and improve it until you have an eagle sign. But he also said that selection cannot work before the prototype is functioning at least to some extent. If you see nothing at all, then there is nothing to select for. So uh, the, uh, the, this must have been a very rare stochastic event. And therefore, uh, the, the neo-Darwinistic theory of Ernst Meyer, etc., was completely wrong that this could have happened 40 to 60 times independently in evolution. So my graduate student, Rebecca Quiring, found uh, by pure serendipity that these two genes are uh, homologous in the mouse and in Drosophila. The small i gene in the mouse is homologous to the eyeless gene in Drosophila. And that gave me numerous sleepless nights. Uh, and finally, I came out with the crazy idea that maybe the same master control gene is working in mice and in, in flies. And that uh, this, this single gene actually initiates is the master switch for eye development. And uh, I recruited these two guys here to do the experiment, which of course you were for months and months didn't work, but finally it panned out. And for this picture, I have no control. This was obviously taken after the experiment was successful, as you can see. <laughs> so what the experiment was, you, you probably all know that uh, we used the GAL4 system to express a single master control gene on the antenna or on the leg, and we were capable of inducing ectopic eyes. And uh, the same is possible with the mouse gene. They substitute for one another. And then we worked out the top of the hierarchy of, uh, of eye morphogenesis. On the top, it turned out that PAC6, which is the gene called in the mouse, was duplicated in Drosophila, and the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the second copy, the twin of Eilis gene is on top, activates Eilis, together they activate Cineoculis, then you have an autoregulatory feedback loop, and you have uh, heterodimer formation, doxone, and uh, at, you need at least three, uh, three genes, PAX genes, to make this eye. And then we deciphered the eye developmental program. We need about at least a thousand genes to make a drosophila eye. But we start with a single master control gene. Then you have to position it on the embryo. We found out all the repressors with except one to position it in the head region. And uh, this is an interesting fossil. This is a non ichophore peripatus relative, and this, this has a normal compound eye. This is Cambrium, 530 million years old, from Chengyang, has a single eye on the head, but one of its relatives has a wonderful thing, has an eye in each body segment, you see? So that the prototype segment, which I've worked on for many years, actually originally had an eye. Uh, so my theory now is that uh, originally you had to develop uh, a, a light receptor like rhodopsin. Then you get to a single cell which has pigment in the same cell and the photoreceptor molecule. Then you get differentiation into two cell types, pigment cell by MITF. This is also clear now. And PAC6 is responsible for the photoreceptor. And then you have radiation in all of these cell types. And I'm happy to say that uh, Ernst Meyer, when he was 99, he said, the origin of eyes in 40 branches of the evolutionary tree was always considered to be an independent convergent development. Molecular biology, he means Walter Gehring, has now shown that, the, <laughs> that the, this is not entirely correct. I would say it's totally wrong. But, uh, <laughs> 
Anyway, he admits it, and uh, this fits well with the, with uh, Dan Dan's uh, anecdotes about about uh, and smiling. But one thing I will never be able to explain, and these are the beautiful eyes of a beautiful woman that will always be an enigma to us men. We have to accept that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, for your very illuminated talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are a bit late, and I have a dilemma now, because it seems to me that it would be good to have uh, Dr. Ferda, who is talking about similar topics before giving the floor to, do you agree, to Dr. Bozius, because they are not going to speak about the same thing. You, you, you don't mind? Okay. <laughs> so you have 10, 11 minutes to, okay. So, uh, sorry. Dr. Roberto Ferda will talk about metazoanopsin evolution reveals a simple route to animal vision. Okay, so good evening to everybody and Roberto, as you know, and then PhD student lab of David Pisani. Ah, uh, sorry, and so I try it through it. So I am PhD student lab of David Pisani. So I am going to show you some results from my PhD. For almost one year and a half, I work in on the origin of vision on animals, focusing one specific aspect are the origin and the gene duplication of the opsins. The origin and gene duplication of opsin. So thanks, sorry. And uh, as you, if you remember from the previous work, the, from the previous talk, so the both cnidarians and bilaterians have, have eyes. This suggests that probably the common ancestor of these two groups had something that looked like an eyes. Mm -hmm. And it is very interesting to note that both using the G a G-protein cavity receptor system for the vision, uh, there are opsins. The opsins are G-protein cavity receptor with the ability to react at the light. This ability is, is related to the presence of the, a domain that is called radial bind domain that is in the last alpha helix. It is 17 amino acid long domain. If you see, is a, there is a logo here, there is a certain level of variability for 16 of these amino acids. So with the lysines that with reference to bovenrodopsins 296 is the most conserved amino acid in the, in the opsins. It's very important lysines because basically it binds a chromophore, it's a molecule that's able to react at light, and this binding, so it's a molecule that in presence of light changes conformations which on the physiological signal for cascade. So, it's a physiological signal of the vision. Uh, if we look at the distribution of the opsins in, the, in animals, we see there are three main paralogous groups. There are R opsins, C opsins, RGRGO opsins. And there is a certain level of relationship between the opsins and where they are expressed. So R opsins are usually expressed in rhabdomeric receptor. C opsins and RG opsins are expressed in ciliary receptor. Plus, there is a, the last paralogous group that has been suggested in a paper in 2007 by Placeski et al. that are called cnidarian crind opsins, that apparently are, are cnidarian specific lineages of opsins. If we, if we try to map on a phylogenetic tree, we see that bilaterians had RGR, G, and R opsins. So, where cnidaria have C opsins, R opsins, Opsins. When I started this project, I had in mind three fundamental questions of opsin evolution. First, how are they related? Which one are the relationship between the main paralogous groups? Second, where did opsin come from? Which one is the closest out of opsins? And finally, to give a time scale evolution opsin evolu of the opsins, understand when the ability to react at the light arise. So why I decided to to, to ask these questions clear in these slides, where I show that the relationship between the mean paralogous group are unclear. I, in this case, each triangle okay, is a paralogous group, so the code is just right there. There are, since 2008, uh, 2007, there were four competing hypotheses on opsin evolution. The first one was proposed by Plaseski in 2007, where they uh, defined the clinidopsins as a clinidarian specific lineages of opsins. Uh, and they say that almost all the Kinidarian opsin were sister group of a clade composed by RGR 
and our opsins with one single opsin <coughs> set in the opsins that was sister group of C opsins. In 2008, Sug and collaborators published a different topology where the Knidera opsins were split in three groups. The first with sister group of C, the second sister group with R, and the remaining with two were sister group of all the visual opsins. In 2010, Plaseski changed their mind in their vision opsin evolution. They changed a completely different topology, and they suggest that the Knidera and opsin were sister group of all the visual opsins. In 2011, Porter et al. suggested that the Knidera and opsin in this case were monophyletic group, sister group of, of the C opsins. It's important to keep in mind the point that with notable exception of Sug et al., all the other papers did not use the complete sets of the non-bilateral opsins. So it's clear that we, we, we need to improve, so methodologically, the analysis. It will t this is what we did. Basically, is a we, we run thousands of phylogenetic trees to test the hypothesis. We use the complete set of published non-bilateral opsins, so of the, the complete set from Plaseski 2007, Suga, Porter, and Plaseski 2010. We had the unpublished genome of sponges set in the light that probably sponges are paraphyletic group. This is um, more closely related to the animal, to the metazoan. And we had the complete set of non bilateral genomes. From a phylogenetic point of view, we identified the closest out group of the, uh, of the opsins. So we use a more sophisticated software for alignment at the sprung. And finally, for each data set, we estimate a specific substitu substitution matrix. So in, in each case, all substitution matrix was a GTR, fit better, fit better the data than the pre-computed one. From a technical point of view, there is a key point here. So I assembled two different data sets, starting from 450 sequences. I ran the first unrooted opsin tree. The idea is to have a, a null hypothesis of the, out of the tree of opsins without the potential misleading influence of the outgroup. So, because we cannot run, we cannot infer the part of dupli gene duplication using an arrotent tree, we start to look at the outgroup. And we basically use all the potential outgroup in opsins, plus using this, data this database that's called G-Protein Capped Receptor Database. Plus, be because, but the problem of G-Protein Capped Receptor Database is biased, so to avoid uh, of vertebrates, it's full of sequence of vertebrates. We use all the sequence for blast against non bilateral genomes. If we assemble a second data set was 625 sequences. I'm going to show the result from the first, the root and tree. The root and tree is, is very interesting because we found, discovered the monophyly of all the bilateral opsins. So R opsin, C opsins, and RGR, G opsins are a monophyletic group. The Knidarian opsins are split in three groups that we named group A, group B, and group C. The group A sequence were the set two sequences that is two in the Suketal work were sister group of all the visual opsins. But as I said before, we cannot infer the part on duplication using an arrotent tree. We start to add the outgroup. And the first interesting finding said that the closest outgroup that we were, were able to identify were three sequences of tricoplax. That is a very small animal without the ability to arc the light. So basically, tricoplax doesn't have eyes but has an opsins. Why is an opsins? Because the closest out group with no function are the melatonin receptor, and because the melatonin receptor are both present, tricoplax, cnidarians, and bilaterians, so those, these three sequences come from the same evolutionary events that there was a gene duplication, and are present in only in tricoplax. But methodologically, the presence of distant related out group can generate non phylogenetic signal, long branch attraction or compositional attraction. We decide to, so, random analysis, removing the most distant outgroup. And what we found is that the topology doesn't change. In this case, we were able to identify, to split the Knidaran opsin in three groups that were C. So, part of the Knidaran opsin were together with C, part with RGR, and the remaining part with R opsin. We suggest that Knidaran opsin as a definition, Knidaran specific lineages should be dismissed because they are C, RGR, or are opsins in Canadarians. The most interesting findings is, okay, it's interesting to know also that this topology is coherent with the pattern expression where we have C and RGR, both are expressed in the CD receptor, uh, and are opsin are usually expressed in the abdomenic receptor. The most interesting findings is that despite our phylogenetically, 
those three sequences are opsins, they are not able to detect the light. So we then perform, because they don't, doesn't have the radial bind domain, we then perform an ancestral set reconstruction. Uh, this is in, uh, in, so each, so the size of the letter, so is a proportional to the probability to find a certain amino acid in the particular position. In red, there is the license, so the key amino acid. And we see that the last common ancestor of all the opsin, that is this node here, doesn't have a license as the, the last common ancestor of the metazone opsin doesn't have a license, despite this, there's a certain probability to find a, lice, a license. This suggests that probably the opsins arise with a different function, and after was a neo-functionalization in the metazone lineages. Um, and finally, our pattern of gene duplication is extremely parsimonious, because we found it's possible to explain our scenario with three duplication, as one, two, and three, and no deletions. So the first duplication results in the separation between the melatonin receptor on one side and the, the, the grandfather of the opsin on the other side. After there was a speciation event with Knida, so the separation between the placozoan and the umetazoan, and after there was in a row, in a short amount of time, there's 11 million years, as suggested by Herwin in science in this year, two duplication in a very short amount of time. The first was a separation between RGR and C opsin on one side and R opsin this side, that is one. And the second separation was the separation between RGR, GO, and C opsins. Also, there are, there are potential problems because the Cnidarian, the Cnidarian apparently doesn't have a rhabdomeric receptor, and, but there are some papers like Nordstrom in 2003 that suggest that probably they have, at least in the larva stage, as Professor Gering say. And we suggest also, if we assume that ciliary receptors, so the, uh, that the ops, the R opsin are expressed in the ciliary receptor, the RGR, GO, and the RC opsin are expressed in the ciliary receptor, we suggest a common ancestor of the umetazone and the functionalized with all the paralogues that we know now, and with both the photoreceptor. And this was more, much more complex than we think now. And say a last thank one say to thanks to Scott Nichols and Nicole King for giving me the opportunity to work with the, the unpublished genome of Scarella Carmela. So Omar Roda Sabelli for the uh, helps with the GR matrix, the IRC set for funding, and the Czech computation infrastructure for the computation infrastructure. <laughs> so, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Perhaps. Uh, one, one question, uh, yeah, okay. because you are very late, and we have to keep some time for the general discussion. It's, Please. A, it's a very nice paper which you read here, and uh, it shows, shows me two things. Uh, you included the blockosoa, which we didn't have, the blockosoa data, and it shows that the more you can include, the better your pedigrees become. But we were very close, so... Uh, that's at least satisfying. But uh, in general, the more data we would have of the uh, now no longer existing groups, we could reconstruct the phylogenetic tree much better. And so we will always have gaps in our phylogenetic trees, but sometimes we can jump over the gap. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps we'll go back to you, uh, general discussion. So, as I said in, in the beginning, we will uh, listen to uh, Dr. Bozius, and the title of his uh, 